Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. married couple was going out for the evening and called in a teenage babysitter to take care of their three children. When she arrived, they told her they probably wouldn't be back until late, that the kids were already asleep and don't disturb them. The babysitter starts doing her homework while awaiting a call from her boyfriend, and after a while, the phone rings... And she answers, but there's no one on the other end, just silence, and whoever it was just hangs up. After a few more minutes, the phone rings again. She answers, and this time there's a man on the line who says, in a chilling voice, Have you checked the children? And then he hangs up. At first she thinks it might have been the father calling to check up, and he got interrupted, decides to ignore it. Ah, probably nothing. She goes back to her homework, and then the phone rings again. Have you checked the children? Mr. Murphy, she said, but the caller hangs up again. She decides to phone the restaurant, where the parents said they'd be dining, but when she asks for Mr. Murphy, she's told he and his wife left 45 minutes earlier. So she calls the police and reports a stranger's been calling the house and hanging up. Has he threatened you? No, she says. Well, there's nothing we can really do about it. You could try reporting the prank caller to the phone company. A few minutes go by and she gets another call. Why haven't you checked the children? Who is this, she says, but he hangs up again. She dials 911 and she says, I'm frightened. I know he's out there. He's watching me. Have you seen him? No. Well, there's not much we can do about it. But she goes into panic mode. She pleads, please help me, please do something. Okay, fine, it'll be all right. Give me your number and your street address. And if you can keep this guy on the phone for just a few minutes, we'll try and trace the call. What's your name again? I'm Linda. All right, Linda. If he calls back, we'll do our best to trace the call. Just keep calm. Can you do that for me? Yes. And she hangs up, and she decides to turn the lights down so she can see if anybody's outside, and that's when the phone rings again. It's me, the familiar voice says. Why did you turn the lights down? Can you see me? Yes. Look, you've scared me, all right? I'm shaking. Are you happy? Is that what you wanted? No. Then what do you want, she said. And there was a long pause, and he replied, Your blood all over me. And she slammed the phone down, terrified. Almost immediately it rang again. Leave me alone, she screamed. But the dispatcher was the person calling back on the phone, his voice urgent. Linda, we've traced the call. We traced the call. It's coming from another room inside the house. He's inside the house. Get out of there now. She tears to the front door, attempting to unlock it to get outside, only to find the chain at the top still latched and the time it takes her to unhook it. She can see the door open at the top of the stairs, light streaming from the children's bedroom revealing the profile of a man standing just inside. She finally gets the door open and she bursts outside only to find 
a police officer standing on the doorstep, gun drawn. At this point, she's safe, of course. But when they capture the intruder, she sees he's covered in blood. The blood of murdered children. Had she gone upstairs to check the children, he would have been covered in her blood, too. Of course, teenagers have been scaring each other silly with this particular urban legend since the late 1960s. Though most people nowadays are uh, probably more familiar with it as the plot of a movie that came out in 1979, a horror film called When a Stranger Calls. There's a remake that was done in 2006 that you should skip. <laughs> but the, uh, two, uh, the 1979 version was really, really creepy. I mean, I think it's even creepy today, and you can find the opening on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and type in When a Stranger Calls or Have You Checked the Children? And uh, it's Carol Kane, of all people, playing a young babysitter. And I'll tell you, the, the scene when the, uh, the door in the upstairs opens and you see the shadow after hearing sort of the disembodied voice, it's a little bit creepy. Hope you enjoy the Halloween holiday. That's what tonight is all about. We're spending the evening just sort of swapping ghost stories. And uh, we've got a few tonight. Uh, I've got an eclectic list of ghost stories, including some haunted places. A few haunted people, and a few haunted animals. In fact, the story that I'm going to be finishing the show with tonight is one of the most bizarre, <laughs> one of the most bizarre stories I've ever heard. And when I read it, I thought, that's the finish to today's show. That's what we're going to close out with. Uh, a haunted animal story that will bring a smile to your... It won't, it won't scare you, but it will leave you with a... What the hell was that? <laughs> Look on your face. Uh, we've had several people who've sent in um, ghost stories emails from all across the place. We've had... Uh, I had one from Madeline. She said this. She said, I want to share a scary story my dad told me that took place in his home village in Laos. My ethnicity is Hmong and I was raised a Christian before transitioning into an atheist life this year. Many stories my dad shared tied back to the religion, the Hmong practice, shamanism. There's a belief in different kinds of reincarnation, and sometimes kids can be a reincarnation of their parent's foe from a past life because the parent owes the reincarnated foe a debt, not necessarily a financial debt. It could be something like revenge, even. There was a couple in a Hmong village in Laos. I've been trying to have a family for years, but every time the wife gave birth to a baby, the child didn't live past four or five years of age. Whenever one child was born, they could not conceive another baby until after the living child died. After several deaths, the couple began to lose hope. And then finally, they gave birth to a boy who lived past the years of his older siblings that had not survived. One ordinary day, the father took his son on a hunting trip. On their way, they stopped at the burial site where the children were buried. After paying his respect, the father gathered his tools for the hunting trip. And while preparing those tools, he noticed his son tapping each gravestone, saying, This one is me, and this one is also me. This one here is me, too. After the sun reached the end of all the gravestones, he stood in front of an empty spot, pointing at it, and said, This is where I will be. Witnessing this, the father realized that his son was a reincarnation of a past foe who has come several times in his current lifetime in the disguise as his child to collect what he owed in his previous life. The child was the cause of his fruitless family. Quickly and carefully, the father gathered a large pile of wood and fenced the wood pile in. Then he grabbed his son, threw him in the wood pile, and burned his son alive. The child screamed and cried for help, but the only thing the father said was, I've paid my debt to you many times. Don't ever come back, or I will burn you again. After the child's body was burned, and the fire died down, the father returned to his village and told the villagers what had just happened. Within that year, the couple had a child, and a few years after that first child, 
they had many more. No child died and everyone grew up to have families of their own. Madeline continues, I used to think, wow, thank goodness the father burned that kid and stopped the reincarnation cycle. But ever since I realized I'm an atheist, I revisited my old thoughts and felt sick at my ignorance and lack of empathy. It hit me that the moral of the story completely steered away from the fact that a child was murdered by his father over a ridiculous belief in reincarnation. In fact, it justified the murder as reasonable for those who are looking at it with skewed religious goggles. I think the story teaches us how beliefs like this can interrupt logical thinking and rationalize delusions in such a way that can cause harm to others. It has a twisted way of taking the value of life. Madeline, thank you so much for the message. Let's go to the switchboard and see what you have to say tonight. Area code 660. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, this is Brian. Can you hear me? I sure can. Thanks so much for calling the show. What do you have for us tonight? A long time ago, back when The Sixth Sense came out, if you can remember that movie, yeah. and that Shyamalan movie, there was a big craze going around, and everybody was talking about ghosts and ghost stories after this movie came out. And they were talking about the stories in which they saw dead people and things like that. And that was just, it was really funny to me. I was raised in a non-religious home, not necessarily atheist, but my dad always taught me to kind of question everything. And even he was kind of into this whole ghost existing thing. And I was like, I, I didn't really buy into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, there's a story that his girlfriend's son had that he could see an old man standing down a hallway in the house that they grew up in and how scared they were that this old creepy man that nobody else could see was hiding and, you know, he, w he would talk to the kid and stuff like that. And he was just two or three at the time. And it was just kind of a funny story. And I, I remember this whole thing about ghosts coming up and being a big deal back in the day and it just strikes me as funny that we believe in these things we hold on to these strange beliefs yeah we're doing a show next uh next tuesday night called rational people irrational fears and we're going to get into a lot of the things that sort of creep us out the weird phobias we have because a lot of us are guilty of that i've got a few phobias of my own the things that no matter how i rationalize it out and how logical I attempt to be about it, it still freaks me out. And I think a lot of people are like that. So to so to stay in the Halloween theme, I think we're going to do that next Tuesday night. So try to join us for that, okay? I will. That's awesome. I also wanted to ask you if you're going to be at Skepticon in Springfield, Missouri. I will. I'll be there uh, the weekend of November the 15th in Springfield. And if anybody wants details on that free event, they can go to Skepticon.org. It's going to be awesome. Hope to see you there. Thanks for the call, man. Take care. Awesome. I'll be there. All Thank right. you. You know, it's funny. Uh, haunted places abound. And one of the most interesting ones I read about recently is in Estes Park, Colorado. It's called the Stanley Hotel. 140 rooms, panoramic views of the Colorado Rockies. Just beautiful. But also a little bit eerie. It opened on July the 4th in 1909, built by Freeland Oscar Stanley. He's the guy behind the Stanley Steam Engine Automobile. And it catered to the rich and famous. Not the automobile, the hotel. <laughs> well, maybe the automobile. Famous guests include Theodore Roosevelt, the Emperor of Japan, John Philip Sousa, and a famous survivor of the Titanic disaster, the unsinkable Molly Brown. Now, if you stay at the Stanley Hotel, keep a close eye on the ballroom, as the ballroom is the reported location of many strange and supernatural events. Kitchen staff have reported the sounds of a party going on in the ballroom, when the hall was empty and no events were scheduled. Guests in the lobby report hearing a piano playing, but nobody was sitting at the piano and it speculated perhaps Mrs. Stanley. Flora Stanley, a pianist in those early days, is simply returning to her place at the keys. In one particular guest room, guests say they've seen a man standing over a bed looking out a window and then turning and running into a closet. It's been claimed this is the original owner of the land, Lord Dunraven. Lord Dunraven was a British guy who was run out of the area. He tried to swindle people out of their land and money. And 
Once he was gone, they built the hotel. Other guests, they say they've had sightings, they've had items, suddenly vanished, jewelry, watches, luggage. Still others say they've seen random ghost-like figures, voices, they've heard laughter, the sounds of children playing, furniture moving, even levitating. Another, more contemporary famous guest, Stephen King. He was staying in room 217. This is true. He was staying in room 217 in an almost empty hotel. It was about to be closed for an extended period of time. And that experience gave birth to one of the most iconic hotels in all of fiction. Of course, we're talking about the Overlook Hotel. And in fact, showing on a continuous loop on channel 42 of the guest room televisions at that hotel is the famous Stanley Kubrick film based on Stephen King's book, The Shining. The 1997 TV miniseries, that version of The Shining was actually filmed there at the hotel. And in May of this last year, the Stanley Hotel hosted an appropriate occasion for fans of haunted places. They had a horror movie film festival. I've always wanted to stay in a haunted place. I don't believe in ghosts or spirits, but I would love to be able to spend the night in a haunted, quote-unquote, haunted place and just see. Just see. We'll set up some cameras. We'll set up some microphones. I'm not saying we turn into ghost adventures, but come on, let's just go just for the hell of it, just for the experience of it. The power of suggestion The lights low, who knows, people downstairs just turning the screw, banging up against the wall (laughs) to to see what happens, to see how scary they can make it. I've always thought it'd be amazing. You know, there was um, was some of those abandoned facilities, uh, old prisons, old asylums that are still furnished somewhat. You know, the old metal chairs and the hospital gurneys, some of the old prisons with the old electric chairs still in place. Imagine spending the night there. No electricity, no light, no companionship, just you and your own imagination. I think, I think I could pull it off. I don't know, I'm a big man till I get there. I'm a big tough guy till I get there. And then I'm like, uh, you know, this may have been a bad idea. Area code 405, you're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? This is Nizar. I've been a big fan of yours for the past couple of months, actually. I've been trying to get on your show. It's kind of a um, funny thing. I didn't want to really get into religion, but I'm an atheist now. I've actually been an atheist for the past two years. And before that, you might be surprised, but I was an ex-Muslim. I'm actually studying at the University of Oklahoma. Wow. <laughs> and I'm from the Middle East. And one of the actual, like, it's not really a Halloween horror story, but it's one of those things that you probably would hear on Halloween and be you know, like freaked out. So, you know, like back at home, you know, one of those things that they use is fear, you know, to manipulate you into a thing to, you know, religion. So one of the things I remember when I was a kid was um, one time they were, you know, telling us that as God, you know, loves you and you believe in him and so forth. But if you disobey or you do a simple thing, say, for example, standing up to your parents, even though they're not good parents, that you would be in a burning hell. And I remember for the longest time that every time I used to go to bed after hearing that, I'd have nightmares <laughs> and uh, waking up freaked out. It's just one of those things that when you think about, to be honest, if you want to actually be scared, either read the Quran or read the Bible or read one of those crazy folks. I think that would be probably the best horror story you can give anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad you escaped. You know, I'm glad you escaped and have found your own voice. And I, I wish you all the best. Absolutely. I'm so glad you called the show. And I appreciate everything, man. Take care of yourself. Thank you very much. This story is out of Indiana. Carmen Winstead was 17 years old. Awkward, mysterious, not many friends, and a cloak of sadness and loneliness and eeriness all around her. Carmen was different, and the other girls at school never let her forget it. About six years ago, the school held a fire drill, and all the students funneled into the yard. At the end of the yard, near the fence, was a sewer drain with a round top and the cover pulled off, and it wasn't long before a gang of teasing girls pushed little Carmen toward the hole, taunting her, frightening her, ignoring her pleadings to please stop, please stop. 
and then the girls pushed her in. No doubt reveling in the humiliation Carmen would feel at being so helpless in such a vile and disgusting place. They pushed her in and looked down with glee, already anticipating the terrified look on her face. But Carmen Winstead never emerged. And it was obvious something had gone horribly wrong. The girls decided to tell the teachers that it was an accident. Carmen had merely wandered into that corner of the yard and fallen in by accident. That's the story they told the police who interviewed them. We don't know why she fell. She just wandered over there and... And then she slipped. It was just so terrible. The officers believed their story, and upon the retrieval of Carmen Winstead's body, it was determined that she broke her neck on a concrete shelf at the bottom of the sewer, a freak accident. Shortly afterward, the girls began reporting variations on the same thing. They would take a shower, and they'd feel a finger on the shoulder, but nobody would be there. They'd be brushing their teeth, and a hand would touch them on the back, but they were alone. Some said they were sitting on the toilet and felt a touch from inside the bowl, as if something was crawling up from the sewer itself. And on one chilly October morning, the girls met each other in the schoolyard, their faces white, their eyes filled with tears, their hands trembling, their hearts paralyzed by fear. Each one had awoken that morning, gotten out of bed, and started their routine with a hot shower. But each of the six girls in different houses and different neighborhoods at different times that morning had emerged from the shower to see words written by a finger on the steamed bathroom mirror. For each girl, the words were exactly the same. I was pushed. None of these girls have since found a restful night or any kind of real peace. Does Carmen's spirit live on? Well, it's said that when you go into the bathroom and you get that creepy feeling, you know the feeling. You look around the corners, you check behind the shower curtain, you fear something slithering out of the drain. You hear the sound of pipes rattling, you feel a chill. You double check because it feels like you're being watched. You're in a place of isolation, naked, vulnerable. And you feel another presence in the room. Some say it's Carmen Winstead, tossed into the sewer years ago. Humiliated and pushed to her death, now back from the grave and determined for all eternity to keep pushing back. A lot of people say that they have a a fear of what's behind the shower curtain. I guess that's a common thing. Many people walk into the bathroom and they always look around behind the curtain to make sure no one is there. Do you do that? Do you walk in and just as a reflex, just Push the curtain back just to be sure. Do you really think there might be something or someone back there? Would you be able to go in and do whatever it is you needed to do in there without looking behind the curtain? Maybe we'll talk about that some more next week as we talk about rational people and irrational fears. I've got Joshua on Skype. Thanks for calling the Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast. How's it going? How you go, mate? I'm doing well, doing well. What's going on with you, my friend? I've got some hospital sort of ghost story type stuff. Now, you work at a hospital. Yeah, I've been there for 22 years now. And, uh, and uh, hospitals can be scary a, places, man. I do night shifts. It's dark, it's all locked down, and uh, things go bump in the night when you're there. It's probably your mind playing tricks on you, obviously. We used to have a bit of a, a myth. When the hospital was being built, one of the tradesmen fell down the lift well from eye floor which is about the ninth floor and we used to go to eye floor at night time and all the lifts would stop up on eye floor but when you came out to the lift well area foyer the lift doors would just open before you hit the buttons or anything and this is at night time so it's like oh shit you know and there was a <laughs> um, the, the story was that 
Yeah, his ghost haunted the lift wells. And because he died on the ice, he fell off eye floor. That's where his ghost was haunting. Uh, so these lifts would always stop on eye floor. And, yeah, the, at night time, quite often, you'd go to push the button and the doors would open before you, you did it, just randomly. They shouldn't, there's no reason why they should, but the other one we had, the only time I reckon I've seen a ghost in brackets, we had to go to the morgue one night, myself and a guy called Steve, and the morgue at the old hospital was just 300 foot long corridor through pathology, and the morgue was right down the back of it. Now, at night time, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the whole place is lights out dark. So the only lights you have are the exit lights down the corridor, which didn't really light things up. So we walked down there. We had the body on a trolley. So you used to enter. You walk down the end. You go into the morgue. You put the body on the morgue trolley, and you do the bit of paperwork. Anyway, we're walking down. No lights on. On the left-hand side, you've got all these rooms full of pathology testing equipment and computers and all that. And of course, you're looking inside because it's dark and it's creepy and there's no one there. On the way out, we're walking back out. We've both looked in to the, one of the pathology rooms again. There's a computer on and there's this old woman there in a lab coat with this no lights on except for the, the computer screen just sitting there and she turned and looked at us and me and my mate have just looked at each other and we've run <laughs> with the trolley <laughs> back down the corridor. <laughs> now, she wasn't there 10 minutes earlier and there's no reason for her to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning on a weekday because it's all shut down and we don't know what we saw that night and we, you know, we just put it down to being creeped out, I guess. The morgue is what? Do they keep it in the basement? Is that the stereo? That's what they always no, say. No, no. The morgue is always in no, the basement. No, no, no. Well, this this was an old hospital morgue, and it was up on like the sixth floor. The new hospital we've got now, it's on the second floor, but it's totally different. It's just a big freezer, uh, industrial freezer now, just with trays inside it, and it's not a scary place. You get used to it. I was, I was. Oh, yeah, it's not scary to place. you. Yeah, you you you're there how many <laughs> hours a week? I'll tell you what, it's scary, and it freaks me. We take people up there every now and then. Where the morgue is now in the new hospital, the autopsy theatres are out the back of it, and you walk into the autopsy theatres at 3 o'clock in the morning when the lights are out, and that's a bit freaky. That <laughs> freaks people out. We get people that won't come up there because it just freaks them out. Yeah, of fun. course it'll the other... freak them out, these bodies lying there. And, you know, I think it would be scarier to have the body under the sheet rather than just lying there. Oh, yeah. Well, one trick we do, or we used to do, was when we got new grad nurses first, you know, brand new nurses come in, we used to um, have to show them how to clean a body after the person's deceased. You know, you've got to clean the body and put it in a body bag and tag it and all that sort of stuff. But what we used to do, just as a bit of a joke, I'd jump in the body bag and then we put the body bag in the body in the body hold room, and I'd just be lying there in the body bag, and they'd slowly unzip it. Wow. And it's like, okay, you've got to check for rings and stuff on the person. So the, per the the new student had put their hand in, and I'd go and grab their hand and sit up or something like that and scare the crap out of them. Yeah, well, yeah, if their heart would have stopped, you would have had to leave them there in the morgue, because <laughs> yeah. that's exactly yeah. what would have happened to me, I think. Josh, that's good stuff. Well, I appreciate you being a part of the broadcast tonight. And thanks for uh, thanks for listening. I hope you have a happy Halloween, my friend. I will, mate. You have a good one too. All right, take care of yourself. See ya. All right, that's awesome. There are some bizarre ghost stories out there. Here's one out of Malaysia. They have a couple of really freaky ones. They have one called the Hentu Tetik, which translates most commonly as breast ghost. And this ghost lures men to their doom. And as I understand it, the ghost has three breasts, including one on the back. <laughs> Two on the front, one on the back. Anyway, that's a Malay. You can look it up. I'm not telling the story here. It's Hantu, H-A-N-T-U, Tetek, T-E-T-E-K, and it's legitimate, okay? But this one, in my opinion, tops that. It's the tale of the Toyol, and it's a twisted little story. Superstitious Malaysians are scared to death of Toyols. A Toyol is said to be the spirit of a dead human 
fetus. Its life cut short inside the womb. It is then summoned by those with supernatural power, the power of black magic to do their bidding. And they usually do mischief and theft for their masters. The toil is kept inside a jar or a box until it is sent out on its dark errands. Now, indeed, Malaysians fear the night when they close their eyes for sleep, and while they dream, a tiny fetus body comes into their home and walks from room to room, watching them while they sleep, filling its tiny hands with whatever objects it can carry back to its master. Some believe the toil can be thwarted. The undead fetuses apparently do not like needles or mirrors or if you strategically place marbles, beads, tiny rocks or anything that might function as a diversion or even a children's toy. The toil will stop, drop whatever it has stolen and take the quote-unquote toys instead. According to the Japanese version of the myth, the toil can be kept for financial gain, but in exchange, a female member of the family must allow it to breastfeed from her. Not milk, but blood. The toil can speak with its master. It doesn't like to be alone. It will kill if provoked. It's jealous of living children in the home. Its powers will grow over time. It can even help their male owners find and seduce women. Other legends of the toil say it's a three-foot-tall greenish creature that sucks on the master's big toe at night. Owned and controlled by the rich, and it is afraid of crabs. In Thailand, they're known as the Komen Tong for male spirits and Komen Lei for females, literally translated golden child. They're used for protection. They can whisper in your ear and tell you about impending danger. Komantongs usually wandering souls of dead children that the monks would adopt and give a replacement body, which is usually a small statue that was carved out of tree bark, coral, or even baby bone. It's then placed in a container soaked in perfume or chicken blood. So if you're out there, beware the toil. Area code 502. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Happy Halloween. Who's this? Uh, I'm Joe. Uh, my area code says 502, but I'm nowhere near that. Uh, oh, oh, all right. Well, I'm uh, glad you call in. What's going on? Yeah, I've been listening for a long time, but this is the first time I've ever actually called in on a live show because it always interferes with my work and uh, really excited to be calling in. And um, from where I'm from is originally Kentucky, Louisville. And um, when I was growing up, they've always had these weird, creepy stories about Waverly Hills Sanatorium. It's a pseudo-famous kind of sanatorium that was back in, like, 1910. It was famous for a lot of tuberculosis people dying there. And uh, I actually grew up with some of the kids of the family that owned the estates for a while. And I've actually spent the night there for a few nights. And for every Halloween, they would set up, like, a funky haunted house business. It was actually a pretty well-done haunted house, but it was spooky because... um. We'd spend the night there, and we'd hear things all over the place, and we'd just kind of go wandering. A bit dangerous when I think about it, though. We were only, like, kids in, like, fourth grade. Do you believe in ghosts now, and do you have any sort of belief in that? Because there are a lot of people who are non-believers in a deity out there, but they do believe in a supernatural plane or ghosts or the paranormal or whatnot. Does that re resonate with you? or? I wouldn't say ghosts. My, I mean, the most I would ever say is uh, some sort of event that maybe kind of like left its mark on a place that people can kind of feel for. I'm not, I'm not sure if that really makes sense. It's just, I wouldn't say ghosts, I wouldn't say supernatural, but I say it's definitely worth looking into because it's interesting as all hell. Just one more thing. Have you ever heard of the uh, website Creepypasta? Creepypasta. I have not. It's got a lot of like fan made uh, like spooky stories. It's where the famous web character Slender came from. All right, uh, I'm, going Slenderman, right uh, I'm going right there. Uh, creepy pasta, <laughs> scary paranormal stories, and short horror microfiction. Um, yeah, that would be it. They've got micropasta, Slenderman, zombies, haunted games, and crappy pasta success <laughs> stories. <laughs> uh, that, 
uh, my particular favorite one would be the story of Ben, uh, an alleged spirit of a child named Ben that possessed a copy of Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask for the Nintendo 64. Wow. Well, uh, thanks yeah. for the heads up on that. I'll uh, I'll try to browse it maybe for a few minutes after the show. Much appreciated, my friend. Thank you very much for All having right. me. Take it easy. You know, it's funny. Uh, we talk about scary places and even scary films. I was on Netflix the other night. I'm just in an October mood. The temperatures drop. The days get shorter. And I'm kind of a sucker for scary films. Not necessarily gory films, although scary can be gory. But the most scary films, the most effective scares, are largely bloodless, usually, aren't they? I mean, gore is easy. You can cut somebody's head off, or you can just have... I mean, that's easy. And there's a ton of what they call gore porn out there. But to get under somebody's skin to really rattle their cage, to get them looking over their shoulder, to get them to the point where they, they're they a little nervous about walking in that back room late at night with the lights off. Yeah, that's that takes some skill. I was looking for something last night. I didn't find it. What I did find was a horror movie. Uh, I was foreign made. I, I'm not sure where it was made. I didn't really go too deeply into it. I watched part of it. It was about these snowbound... Zombie Nazis. <laughs> these, these med students go, and uh, you know they're in a cabin, and uh, all of a sudden they find themselves surrounded by zombie Nazis. I, I, it's just, and I guess the zombie Nazi genre is a thing. I guess there are all sorts of different films out there. So. Everybody on Facebook, they're all telling us, hey, man, you've got to check this zombie Nazi film out. Hey, man, you've got to check this zombie Nazi film out. Go figure. So anyway, uh, that's how I spent my Sunday night. <laughs> but I've, I've been looking for a, a genuinely good, scary movie. Something that really gets onto your skin. I was, back when it first came out, I was kind of a fan of the, the first paranormal activity. Of course, now it's completely non-scary. They've totally blown it. I hear The Conjuring is very creepy. I uh, haven't seen it. They say The Conjuring is that kind of film, kind of chills you to the bones. And uh, so there are a few out there. And I've been sort of on the hunt for a good scary movie that doesn't cheat. It doesn't just throw blood and gore at you, but actually has uh, a grip on your, you know, sort of the chills you down to the marrow and gets you to you get your feet up off the floor and you're cuddled up on the couch with the people you care about and you're like save me and then you finish the whole show together that's my kind of film i've got a great ghost story from the year 1919 freddie jackson was a mechanic for the royal air force and he served on the hms deadless in world war one he was on the job and he was horribly, violently killed in a freak accident that involved an airplane propeller. I guess he ended up falling into the propeller and he was just, I mean, horribly killed. He was memorialized and buried just a couple of days later. And it was on that day that his squadron was scheduled to take a group portrait. Sadly, Freddie Jackson would not be there to stand beside his shipmates. Decades later, in 1975, that group photo was published by Sir Victor Goddard, a member of that same squadron years before. And that picture went on to become famous around the world. You see, just behind the airman, positioned on the top row, fourth from the left, is a face that apparently wasn't standing there on the day the photo was taken in 1919. The picture's been shown to many of the surviving members of that squadron, and they all agree that face, that face belongs to Freddie Jackson, the man who was killed two days before. Some say that Freddie simply couldn't bear the thought of being excluded on that day or being absent from his buddies as they posed before the camera. So even though he'd been dead for 48 hours, he showed up anyway. And he stands forever on that last row, immortalized in a photograph, the spirit that on that day could only be seen by the all-seeing eye of the camera. And you can actually find the photograph online. Just Google it, Freddie Jackson photograph, and it'll creep you 
out. Here's a great story that has the benefit of being true. As reported June 12, 1999 in none other than the New York Times. A couple of German tourists checked into a motel, the Burgundy Motor Inn of Atlantic City, New Jersey. They were given the key to room 112 and they planned to stay several days. Jeez, the room stunk. And we all know that sensation of walking into a hotel room and you go, God, gee, it stinks. Sometimes it's the smell of detergent or cleaning chemicals. Sometimes it's because the person before you didn't heed to the no smoking sign in the room. Sometimes the building is just old. A musty relic that has soaked up decades of vacancies and no vacancies, guests, events, parties, spilled food, somebody's pet snuck in through the back entrance, whatever. The uh, couple attempted to stay in the room, but it was just, it was too much. It was too much, so they went down to the front desk to complain, and the hotel staff went to the room to investigate, and they said, yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing. The couple went back. Finally, they decided it was just too much, and they left. Well, the hotel staff eventually discovered a crime scene in room 112. A few days earlier, Saul Hernandez of Queens, New York, had checked in. He'd originally checked out at 6.30 on Sunday morning, but then he went back to his room. His checkout time was noon, and he had the room for a few more hours, but the hotel record showed him gone. Apparently, sometime that morning, someone stabbed Saul Hernandez to death and jammed his body under the motel bed, meaning that if the German couple retired for the night, they were lying mere inches from a bloody, rotting corpse. This really happened, and the scenario is not all that uncommon. On the 10th of July, 2003, a man checked into the Capri Motel just east of downtown Kansas City and complained about a foul odor in his room. Management told him nothing could be done, and he spent three nights, three nights in the hotel room before checking out because he could no longer stand it. When the cleaning staff came in to make up the room on the 13th of July, they lifted the mattress and underneath found a man's body in an advanced stage of decomposition. July 1996, a woman's body was found under a mattress in the Colorado Boulevard Travel Lodge in Pasadena, California. Apparently, the motel staff discovered her 10 days after her demise, and only after guests complained for several days that something in the room stinks. Sonny Millbrook of Memphis, Tennessee, reported missing January 27, 2010, after she failed to pick up her kids from school. 47 days later, on the 15th of March, 2010, homicide investigators were called to the room of a budget inn motel where Millbrook had been living just prior to her disappearance, her body having just been discovered inside the frame of the bed, even though the room had reportedly been cleaned and rented several times since her disappearance, almost seven weeks later. Have you heard the uh, legend of Red Cloak, Blue Cloak? Now, it's interesting how many ghost stories take place in a bathroom. We already covered one tonight. Perhaps it has something to do with our vulnerability in the bathroom, right? The door is closed. We have the supposed assurance of privacy and safety. If that's how you feel, you probably won't care much for this story of Red Cloak, Blue Cloak. And there's a few variations on it. It goes like this. You're sitting, all right? You're, you're sitting there. You're heeding nature's call. And you suddenly hear a voice which says this. It says, do you like the red cloak or the blue cloak? Now you assume it's somebody outside the door playing a prank, right? You don't say anything. And then the voice speaks again. Do you like the red cloak or the blue cloak? And you warn the prankster, just go away. Jeez, leave me alone. It's not funny. There are no footsteps or any signs of movement outside. And then the voice returns and says it again. Do you like the red cloak or the blue cloak? Exasperated, you decide to play along to get it over with. You say, all right, fine, the red cloak. This is not a good answer. As it will cause a figure to appear in front of you. He may cut your throat, chop off your hands at the wrists 
or simply slice you until your naked remains are covered, literally, in a red cloak. So now you're thinking, well, the blue cloak is the correct answer, and you would be wrong. Answer with this, and you'll be strangled to death, your oxygen-deprived face cloaked in a deathly blue. Legend says there's a way to escape either of these grisly ends. If you're in the washroom and you hear the question, do you like the red cloak or the blue cloak, either refuse to answer or choose a color other than red or blue, yellow, purple, green, anything, anything but red or blue, and you'll be given a pass to walk away from what might have been an unexpected tomb. This story is similar. It hails out of Japan. And they've got some freaky ghost stories in Japan. It takes place in a washroom, specifically the third stall from the end of any elementary school bathroom. Some say it only happens on the third floor. It's the story of the spirit of Hanako. The spirit can be summoned with a simple ritual and has multiple potential outcomes. In order to call Hanako, you simply count the stall doors down one, two, and three. Then you knock three times on the door itself and say, Are you there, Hanako? And you listen for a voice that replies, Yes, I'm here. Behind the stall door is reported to be a little girl with bobbed black hair and a red skirt. She is not cute. She is not sweet. She's not really a child. And if you open the door to see her, you risk your life and your very soul. If you open the door, Hanako may simply look at you and then vanish with no physical consequence to you, or Hanako may grab you and push you violently into the toilet and to your death. Of course, you always have the option of not opening the door. You can say the words, are you there, Hanako? And then you hear the reply, yes, I'm here. And you can simply walk away, knowing that only a few inches and a thin metal door separate your physical body and the little girl behind stall number three who might or might not have taken your very last breath. There's a ghost story out of Fairfax County, Virginia that's about bunnies. I am not making this up. The asylum was built after the Civil War. Nobody wanted to live near it and ultimately public distaste caused the institution to be shut down completely. The process of transferring the mental patients to other facilities was due to be finished in 1904, but the whole thing was a mess. So many patients, so few workers. It was inevitable that a few patients escaped and hid in the surrounding woods, many of them delusional and dangerous. Ultimately, all but two patients were found, all but Marcus Luster and Douglas Griffin but they didn't disappear without a trace. In fact, local law enforcement found a trail littered with half-eaten, mutilated bunnies. The trail led deep into the woods to a tunnel bridge crossing a wide creek. And there they found Marcus Luster hanging dead at the tunnel entrance. A note attached to his body that said, You'll never find me no matter how hard you try. Signed, the Bunny Man. And that tunnel has been called Bunny Man Bridge ever since. The legend says, if you walk all the way down the tunnel around midnight, the Bunny Man will grab you and hang you from the entrance of the bridge. Strange deaths and phenomena have been connected with the bridge. There was a young man from Clifton, Virginia, who came upon the bridge while traveling. Later, he killed his parents and he dragged their bodies into the woods to hang them from the bridge and then killed himself. In 1943, three teenagers, two men and a young woman, were at the Bunny Man Bridge for Halloween night. The three youths were found dead, hung from the bridge with their bodies slashed open, all with notes attached to their feet saying the same thing. You'll never catch the Bunny Man. In 2001, after hearing this story, six local students and a guide went out to search the area, and they found mutilated bunny parts 
During their search, and they left the forest after hearing noises and seeing figures moving around out there. So perhaps he's still out there, folks. Living off the corpses of little rabbits. Infamous for a century, and perhaps a century to come, as the bunny man. I had an email in from Kyle. He said, this isn't really a ghost story as much, but it fits quite nicely with the themes of the supernatural and skepticism, so I thought it might be of interest. It begins with me playing a prank on my little brother. I waited until my brother was out of the house and then set about rigging up his bedroom to make it appear as if it was haunted. I attached a toy car to a piece of invisible wire, like fishing line. From outside the room, I could pull this car in a straight line from one end of the room to the other. The result was a toy car that moved seemingly of its own accord. And then I also used string to rig his wardrobe door in such a way that I could open it and close it from outside the room. From his point of view, the door would fly open and slam shut all by itself. The prank was set. That night I waited until he'd gotten settled into bed, then I tiptoed outside his room, and using the network of wires and string, I executed the prank. Judging from the cries of fright coming from inside the room, my mission had been accomplished. Now here's the interesting bit. When I asked him about it the next day, his account was different to how I knew it must have happened. For example, he swore he witnessed the toy car melt through the solid wood of his bedroom door, and then do a U-turn in the middle of the room. In actuality, the car couldn't have done anything other than go from one end of the room to the other in a straight line. In addition to the wardrobe door opening and closing seemingly by itself, so too did the chest of drawers. Now, I hadn't rigged the chest of drawers in any way, so they couldn't possibly have opened. Even after I'd explained the prank and shown him exactly how it worked, he found it hard to believe. I think this is a great example of how we can be tricked into perceiving things that didn't really happen or exaggerating the things that did. Because of this, I think we should take claims of the supernatural with a sizable pinch of salt. There's uh, a lot of interesting research out there about the difference between perception and reality. People are so convinced that what they saw was real. And the truth is, perception and reality are quite often very disconnected. In fact, I believe it's Levin and Kramer have a series of, is it papers or books that talk about the unreliability of eyewitness testimony in courtroom cases. Because if you get someone in there and they're sitting up under oath swearing this is the way it happened, and someone's life or death might be in the balance, well, it's sort of a, a tenuous proposition. You've got flawed subjective perception at work, and it doesn't always line up with the facts. Interesting stuff. Have you heard the story of Arabella? It goes like this. There was a little girl, her name was Lucy, and she was given a tiny doll as a gift by her parents. The doll was made of plastic, about nine inches tall, auburn hair, very tiny thin arms and legs, a little blue dress, tiny black dots for eyes. And it wasn't a frown or a scowl on the doll's face, but there was something unnerving about the expression, somewhat unpleasant. Lucy didn't want to hurt her parents' feelings, but the doll made her nervous, uneasy. She decided to accept the gift and make sure her parents felt appreciated, so she took the doll and then was told by mom and dad that the doll had a name. They said, Lucy, this is Arabella. And this made Lucy even more unnerved and a little bit afraid. Somehow it made the doll seem alive. Now, Lucy was a rational child, and even at that age, didn't believe that she was in any danger or there was anything odd about the doll at all. It was just a doll, and so she put the doll up on the shelf with all of her other dolls. She was a collector, even at that young age. 
But the unnerving expression finally caused her to take Arabella and take her down into a little cupboard at the bottom of the stairs right behind a pile of shoes where her parents would not see. After all, she didn't want to hurt their feelings, but she didn't want the doll in her room. And it was just a few nights later, Lucy was lying in bed in the middle of the night and she heard a noise. She heard a shuffling sound which went on for several minutes, and then a brief dragging sound and finally a scuttling, like tiny footsteps walking very fast. Lucy was paralyzed with fear, unable to move. And then she heard a voice. It was almost a whisper. She could hear it, but it was not loud enough to wake her parents who were sleeping down the hall. Lucy always slept with the door open and the light on in the hallway, as she was a little bit scared of the dark. So she could hear through the open door, and she heard a voice on that night say this. Lucy. I'm on the first step. And then the sound of rapid footsteps and the sound of a closed cabinet door. Lucy didn't sleep at all that night. She just lay there in fear until dawn finally came and her mother got her up for school. She tried to explain what had happened. Mom, it really happened. But she was so sleepy, so weary so red-eyed, so delirious when she told her mom that her mother simply passed it off. It was just a dream, and you know you haven't been getting your rest. Lucy told her parents, we need to take the doll away. Can we take the doll away? But they said, this was a gift from your great aunt. This is a family heirloom, and she wanted you to have this. And so when her parents weren't looking, Lucy went to the cupboard under the stairs and saw... Arabella exactly where Lucy had left her the day before, and she reluctantly went back to bed. That night she fought against sleep, but she was so exhausted, so exhausted, she eventually drifted off. And in the middle of the night, with the light coming through the hallway into the open door, Lucy heard a voice again, Lucy. I'm on the fifth step. And then came a scuffling noise and the sound of a door. And the voice was gone for the night. And Lucy was crying. Deprived of sleep for the rest of the night. At school, she told her friends. She told her teachers. No one believed her. They laughed at her. Lucy could only think that if Arabella was climbing four steps at a time, Every night, there was only one more night to go. That night, Lucy decided she would shut her bedroom door. Lucy's mother came in to tuck her in and noticed that Lucy had closed the bedroom door. Her mother said, are you no longer afraid of the dark? And Lucy said, no, I'm still afraid, but I was hoping tonight we could leave the bedroom light on. Her mother said, no, it's much too bright. If you leave the bedroom light on, you'll never get a wink of sleep. So Lucy reluctantly agreed to leave the bedroom light off and close her door to the hallway. She lay there for hours before finally beginning to doze and she heard the noise again, the scuffling of tiny footsteps. And then a voice that said, Lucy. I'm on the top step. Lucy knew the door was closed, but she was still terrified. Her heart pounding, she knew if she stayed in bed, she wouldn't be safe. And so she got up. She wanted to see for herself. She opened the door and then there was a scream. Lucy's parents found her body at the bottom of the stairs, they guessed she had been on her way to the bathroom without switching on the hallway light and without being able to see it fallen all the way down, breaking her neck. Lying next to the lifeless body of this child was Arabella, the heirloom, the favorite family doll with the pinhole eyes and the little blue dress 
found lying right beside Lucy. And on her face was the expression of a smile. <laughs> of course, stories involving children are quite often scary for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's because something is happening to someone who is vulnerable, right? It's a child. And sometimes it's because the child itself is set up to be scary. And kids can be terrifying. I'm trying to think back over the years, over the decades, of some of the most sort of creepy or terrifying young children. Obviously, um, any child from The Shining, right? Danny or Tony, <laughs> or the two little girls in the hallway in the blue dresses, they remain terrifying after all these decades. Damien from The Omen, still scary. That kid's face is terrifying. I thought Samara in The Ring, you know, the little girl with the black hair that was always draped over her face? She was a scary little kid. The little uh, brunette girl from Orphan who had the pigtails? The very dark eyes and the pigtails and the blue dress. I never saw Orphan. I just see the photographs, the uh, movie posters and publicity stills, and she looks scary. And I'll tell you another child I thought was scary, and, and most have forgotten about this scene. It was the opening scene in the original John Carpenter Halloween. It was the opening shot, that long shot where you see through the mask. It's the first shot of young Michael Myers, right? He's, I don't know, what, 10 years old, and he murders his sister. And he goes out and they take the mask off and you see this sort of innocent but blank looking child in a clown costume holding a knife in the front yard of the house in Haddonfield, Illinois. And that, decades later, remains a terrifying shot of a creepy little child. The story I want to leave you with tonight is a story that I had to see to believe. And it's one of the wackiest tales you've probably heard. It is that of the Highgate Ghost. The story begins at Highgate Pond in England with none other than the philosopher and scientist Sir Francis Bacon. The year is 1626. Sir Francis Bacon got into an argument with a buddy of his named Witherbone over the best way to preserve meat. Francis Bacon insisted that keeping meat cold could make it last longer. Cold temps would act as a natural preservative. Witherbone, who was a doctor, by the way, thought the whole idea was ridiculous. So Bacon went out and decided he was going to prove his point. He got himself a chicken, plucked it, cleaned it, and stuffed it with snow, essentially creating the first frozen chicken. Then Sir Francis Bacon caught pneumonia and died. Now... They said that the site of Sir Francis Bacon's death has been haunted ever since, but not by any human soul. No, for 300 years, the site of Bacon's experiment and subsequent death has been haunted by the ghost of the chicken he killed. Throughout the years, people at Highgate Pond have reported seeing, and I shit you not... <laughs> a plucked headless chicken running around in circles and pecking at the ground for food with a beak it does not possess. Sightings were prevalent through the Second World War with some military troops stationed nearby trying to actually chase and catch the damn thing. No idea what they would have done if they caught it. Maybe served it up with a side of potatoes or something. The last sighting happened back in 1970 there was a couple making out in the yard when they looked up and saw the undead beast. For the last 43 years, the pond and the park had been silent. But beware, my friends, beware the haunted, headless chicken of Highgate Pond. A pecking poultrygeist that apparently still has not gone home to roost. <laughs> Join us next week as we talk about rational people 
and irrational fears. And if you have an irrational fear, maybe it's a place, maybe it's a person, a circumstance, a memory from childhood, whatever, make sure and send that to me via email, podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. Thanks for listening again. Have a great week. We'll see you. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com